Okay, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Business. I'm super excited for this episode. I think it'll be a, a theme on this show that um, I'm always excited. I think it's also I get to try and pick out who my guests are. Um, today we have Brad Jones on the show. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, that's great. It's great to see you excited about what you do. Yes, yeah. <laughs> And uh, hopefully these get easier and easier as they get going, you know, always trying to start something new at the beginning. It's difficult, but I do find that after each episode, it kind of gets a little bit easier. So hopefully, oh, yeah. hopefully after this first season, I guess that uh, I get the hang of it. But thank you for being here. Um, you know, I it was originally my dad who said that I had to get you on, right? <laughs> yeah. Newmarket Nate up too. Yeah. And um it was like, yeah, Brad Jones, karate on Main Street, right? Yeah. But like everyone and everything, there's many more layers that come with it. So we're mm -hmm. excited to get into it. And I'd like to start off every show with, you know, where'd you grow up and what type of kid were you? <laughs> okay. Well, of course, I was uh, born in Newmarket. Uh, my grandparents had a little farm <coughs> on Mulock Side Road, right next to the tracks, directly across from where the town hall is now. And uh, <clears throat> my parents had a house uh, on Walter Avenue in what's known as the Patch today. Yeah, I <laughs> so, live there right now. Oh, yeah? yeah. Okay. Well, it's not that bad anymore. No, no it, it <laughs> had its rough time. But <laughs> yeah. That was the first subdivision in Newmarket yeah. in uh, the 50s. And I have old photographs of the construction of those houses. And uh, that's where we lived. <clears throat> but I spent most of my time at grandparents' house because both parents worked. So it's kind of in the country most of the time. Uh, I could walk from my grandmother's house to Young Street and collect uh, bottles, take them to a place that was called the Bucket of Blood on Young Street, <laughs> which was a dance hall, and cash in and uh, get a Coke and a potato chips and then walk back. And that was the day. <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, <clears throat> right, at that time, Newmarket is only Mulock, Young Street, Davis, Leslie, right? Yeah. Like Actually, that. it wasn't even that far. Um, Eagle Street. Uh, would have been in the further, oh, well, Donmore Drive. Okay. So you have Eagle Street, and just uh, south of that is uh, Donmore Drive, and then it was Fields until Mulock. The town line was there, but the town wasn't there. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, I would walk to my grandmother's place uh, across those fields. And um, uh, when did your parents move here? Uh, my mother's family goes back six generations. Wow. Like my brother researched, uh, we were descendants of British loyalists and Quakers. So they settled uh, just outside of Kettleby on Jane, just south of um, Aurora Side Road. There was a farm, family farm there that uh, just in the last 10 years, my last relative sold it. Um, and my brother found the, t the gravestone of Jonathan Terry in the Pioneer Cemetery. So long, long deep history. roots. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Father's side, uh, his father came from uh, Wales and they settled in Alliston. And um, anyway, they, my parents got together and stayed in Newmarket. Love it. Yeah. I love the OG New Market families. <laughs> and um, so growing up, like what type of kid were you? Were you playing sports? Uh, well, were that's you the thing. Books? Um, not much excited me. My, like any family, I got put in hockey. I think uh, my brightest moment was scoring in my own net because <laughs> I wasn't that interested, I guess. <laughs> Baseball, uh, same thing. You know, I'd be in the middle of the fields watching a ball go over my head thinking, oh, is I supposed to get that? Yeah. Um, so really didn't, uh, I actually spend most of the time out in the woods. Um, as a young guy, I just, we, uh, there was forest in every direction of town and I would often travel out toward, uh, the 400, all those woods out there and just spend every moment. My buddy and I would hang out there every moment there was free winter and summer. <clears throat> We'd make uh, snares and catch rabbits and skin them and eat them and all that kind of stuff. So we kind of lived wild. Yeah. Nature was calling you, though, yeah. immediately. I was definitely more comfortable out in nature, Yeah, uh, which goes on till today. I'm still a canoeist and a sailor and so on. I like, prefer to be outside. Then one day, <clears throat> um, actually, I was, and then I was always fascinated by martial arts. So you'd see a thing on TV once in a while. And I remember being in Cole's Bookstore, which is in, referred to as the Old Plaza. And I picked up the only book that was out on karate. And there was this guy standing there making these weird poses. And I don't know what the hell they all meant. <clears throat> no idea. I bought it, took it home, and I'd be in the basement. I kind of mimic these movements and with no idea what they were even for. Yeah. Um, and then one day I saw a poster on a uh, telephone pole for a karate class that was going to open up. 
So it was September of 1969. I walked in above your uncle's uh, soon-to-be brewery. Yeah. The upper floor uh, is where I took my first karate class in September 1969. And who was leading that class? Because, you know, is it that popular in Canada at this time? No, Um, not at all. There was a guy named Earl Hughes who um, was uh, connected with a fellow in Hamilton. And he ran these classes, and I didn't know at the time, but we didn't do any of the formal stuff. We just did a lot of fighting. And there was no women, there's no kids. It was just hardcore push ups on the knuckles, yep. grueling, grueling workouts. Um, in fact, when I, <clears throat> so I was 14 at the time. And gotcha. I went home and I said to my dad, listen, uh, I want to do this karate stuff. And he looks at me, he says, oh, I didn't mention, I'm also a musician. So as a kid, uh, we all had a band together from about 12 to 15 or so, and we'd play school dances and so on. Uh, Ted Boyd from Boyd's Insurance. He was the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. I mean, all local guys. We, yeah. we played some rock and roll and so on, had fun. And um, so after I told my dad, yeah, I want to take up this karate stuff. He said, well, what do you want to do that crap for? You'll, you won't be able to play guitar anymore. You'll wreck your hands. Well, I proved them wrong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm still playing music and still playing in a band. And uh, anyway, it started there. And at 14, though. First at class, 14. 14. 14 years old. On top of what Only. will now be Old Flame Brewery, number two. That's right. And even though it was a crazy class, you were hooked, though. Uh, yeah. Within months. Yeah. Uh, my mind was made up that, oh, this is what I'm going to do. And uh, I don't know why, what it was exactly. Uh, well, I do. There was, um, there, I think this other sports I was involved in, were great activities, but whatever it was didn't appeal to me. Maybe it was the team sport aspect. And what I found, and maybe that's why I like being in nature more, is that uh, it's just you. Because uh, often I'd go out by myself and just sit in the woods, even winter, sit there for about half an hour, and then everything would come back to life. And that was kind of cool just to be there and not disturbing anything and watching what's going on. So with martial arts training, I found that the premise was you come in with what you have, and it's constant improvement. And there's so many layers. I've been at it now for 52 years. And I can't say I'm learning something new all the time, but you learn different ways. And there's always something to improve. Even though our bodies begin to age, um, we can't physically do what we used to do, but then there's other aspects that have to be researched and, uh, and studied. So it's kept me excited all these years, and a couple of my instructors have actually been training longer than I have. They haven't made a profession of it, but they've been involved since the mid-60s. So uh, that's I think incredible. that's what appealed to me most. So... It calls it calls to you, and mm-hmm. I do love the nature and sitting there, guys. And I'm sure that we'll get into it more. Of, you know, you were meditating before <laughs> anyone was before ever meditating, <laughs> right? Yeah, before yeah, yeah. I had a name, and yeah. but we'll kind of get probably into that later on. Sure. So you you get more and more involved, but and then I guess it starts to pick up, right? Because you go and you start traveling, you get really good. So what? From the gap of 14, couple months, kind of getting into it, until, you know, your first competition. Like, what's uh, that What's that journey like? So the, uh, when I started, there was no, and even today, no one has ever come to my school. I've been running my school for 45 years. No one has ever walked in the door and said, I want to be a competitor. I want to be a world champion. It's always a secondary thing. The, um, I always looked at what we do as, it's a martial art that has a sports component. So once you're involved, because most people come in, it's uh, the main reasons, because we live in a safe country, probably fitness. And you can take all the aspects. You have some meditation, some flexibility work, strength training, coordination work, and you have a great training methodology. That, And if you're bored with the gym, and there's a goal-setting me- uh, mechanism built in there with the belt system and everything. Uh, secondly, we have people who have had problems in their life. Uh, they've been attacked. Uh, they've, had, they've been scared. And they realized, okay, I'm vulnerable. I need to do something about that. So they'll come in and they'll um, appreciate more of the self-defense aspect of it. And uh, often parents will bring in kids that lack confidence and that sort of thing. And that will help them too. Because it's a sort of thing that has never changed in terms of uh, expectations. Um, Here's the bar. Uh, If you don't pass it, you don't pass it. You come back in three months and try again. But here's what you need to work on. And, and we've seen the confidence level in kids over the years just, you know, once they've, they fail the test, they're disappointed, they cry, they kick the cat, whatever. Get back in here and get to work. 
and they realize because unfortunately our society has taken a direction where we don't want to mess anybody's feelings. Yeah. We want to give everybody a medal f- for showing up. Let's say everybody gets a pin or whatever. We keep rewarding mediocrity. Yeah. And uh, the world doesn't work that way. And you know, as an entrepreneur, um, you have to live with your consequences. You make a mistake, it's costing you yeah. either time or money, or but pain. <laughs> and there's a part of an equation called hard work that is yes. uh, needed right. to accomplish anything. Right. So if we have five people and it doesn't matter who put in the most work, everyone gets the end prize. Exactly. It's kind and of defeating the purpose of it. Right. And in the working world or in the entrepreneurial world, there's competition out there. Yeah. And if you want to sit back and do half the effort that someone else, uh, you will not reap the reward. So um, I think some people are realizing that and uh, maybe we're going to slide away from that. But yeah, we'll like a pendulum swing, yeah. right? Actually, going back, um, I would say 10 years ago, I was at a point where I was going to start doing uh, tryouts, physical tryouts. because so I had all these parents bringing kids to me, basically saying, here, fix my kid. They were unfit, overweight, um, lacked focus, and it was just painful trying to teach them. And uh, I would look at them, you can't even touch your toes. You're eight. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah, the yeah. heck is going on? Yeah, you're so, supposed to be made out of rubber right now. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, uh, so I, I had a plan and it was going to implement it. And then things started to change. And the demographic of the students that come in began to change. And the demographic of our community began to change. And we started getting a lot more foreign uh, students coming in, like Russians, uh, Asian. Uh, whatever and that wasn't an issue anymore and I'm, I'm relieved to say we have some kids that really kick ass now they come in there with the, they're they've raised with an expectation that you work hard you do your best and if you don't here's the consequences so i put that aside i don't need to do that anymore yeah but there it was an issue for a while um so for getting into competition um I didn't start to compete. It was one of those things, somebody said, hey, you should try this competition. So yeah. I thought, okay, and I was still a color belt. And I must say, I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> it was rough. Um, there's risk of injury. Now we're not doing, uh, we're not boxing and we're not, uh, doing, like we're not doing full contact. We do semi-contact, which uh, back um, in my, so fast forward, uh, competition sort of grabbed me after I was, uh, uh, black belt and uh, before i even went to japan the first time yeah and where was that were you at that same place like or did no, you no. find a new school that um so i i inherited the school okay in um, 1976 when i got my black belt um the instructor was coming up from toronto a couple times a week and it was a town rec program and uh once i got my black belt, he says well you know what i'm tired of driving up here why don't you take it over so I took it over, and it was a couple of days a week at uh, a school gym. Yep. Actually, we used to use old Newmarket High. Uh, we used to use the old arena way back and um, other school gyms. And then we found, or I found, I'd be running a great program. We're doing great, getting lots of uh, great results. And then the school would say, oh, we're, we have to close for a week because of this or that. And it was interrupting the progress yeah. of students. So I thought, okay. So I have to do something. It was like stopping the momentum that you were building. Yeah. You know. And uh, so I ended up going um, to, uh, first of all, I registered myself as a business uh, and then uh, rented the Legion Hall. <laughs> and that was great for a year or so until uh, they found that we were making too much noise and spilling their beer. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they asked us to leave uh, nicely. And I rented a space on Main Street, but... Um, I guess it's up, you know, where the, the clock tower, about three down from that, the lemon lime was underneath. Yep. It's just been renovated, actually. Uh, and the upper floor, I rented that, and that was my first real dojo. And uh, I think we were there eight or nine years. Uh, I have a so. question for at that time. Yeah. Because, you know, you registered as a business now, yep. right? Are you uh, aware of your going into that direction, right? Now I'm a business owner and I'm going this way too, right? Yeah. Or is it just, I need to do these things to kind of take it to the next level or is it seeing it from all angles? My intention was to make it a, a profession. Yeah. In fact, I've always looked at what I did as a profession where most schools are run on a part-time basis. And at that time, even though I wanted to make it a profession, I still was working full time. Yeah. I'm a tradesman. I have an ele- I'm an electrician. So I was working at the Havlin for 16 years. So working all day, 
and then driving up here and teaching classes. And I couldn't even draw money from it because I only made enough money to pay the rent yeah. and whatever other expenses. So for the first 10 years or so, uh, and the days I wasn't here teaching, I was in the city training myself because I was competing. And I was all throughout the 80s, 80 to 90, I was on the provincial team. And in 84, made the national team and competed at the world championships, Pan American championships, uh, another, there, there were several throughout that year that we had to travel for. Yeah. So many years passed quickly. <laughs> yeah. <for laughs> With sure. zero free time. Yeah. And, uh, being tired a lot, but. Yeah. Uh, but you're loving it. Oh yeah. You're well, I mean, it. you're living it and um, getting up to go to work. Uh, it was just, you know, you do it, then you clock out, you drive up, you do your class, you go home, fall into bed, do it all like that next yeah, day. Yeah, for sure. And that's, you know, most people that start a business that start in their basement or yeah. in their garage, they still have to have a source of income. Yeah. So you kind of figure it out. Yeah, I was uh, building pools. Yeah. Uh, Good physical work. Yeah, building pools and then selling flip-flops with hockey laces called summer skates. Uh <laughs> At night and on the weekends, so it was a great time. <laughs> yeah, that's what it takes. Yeah. Um, so uh, when is the first time you went to Japan? Uh, 78. 78. And yeah. what got you over there? So I always had the um, uh, the interest or the mystique of Japan always got to me. The books I read about the samurai, um, the attitude and what have you really uh, grabbed me. It uh, one thing, uh, growing up in Canada, we don't have a true identity, really. The only ones who, in this country that I've found throughout my life is that the uh, people in Quebec have a distinct culture that they can call their own. Pretty much everywhere else, we're somebody else. Uh, but we're woven together in this mosaic, and it works. But we don't have a true culture. Like friends of mine that live in Europe, you come from Switzerland and you know, we, we have a party and they start singing these songs that are 300 years old and yeah. they all know it. And it's part of their part of their heritage that they just grow up with. It's where we're a mismatch. And something about that culture grabbed me. And it, it was maybe the discipline aspect of it or the the dedication, the um, that samurai spirit and so on that I was reading about in, uh, in magazines that were out at the time. I thought, I have to go. So I went to my sensei. My teacher was Sensei uh, Soroka, Masami Soroka. He only died about uh, four years ago. He introduced karate in Canada back in 1952. Um, interesting fellow who, so yeah, the one, the question? Yeah, I think because I was just, I, I was looking at, he his labeled the father of? Father of Canadian, Canadian karate. karate. Yeah, yeah. He was actually born in Canada. And uh, during the World War II, uh, he, he and his family were put in intern camps, internment camps in BC. And after the war, those people were, when they were released, they were given the option, if you want to go back to Japan, we'll send you, or you stay here, you have nothing, because they've taken everything from them. He decided to go back to Japan, and the country was in ruin. Uh, a documentary was done uh, about him uh, by a friend of mine, actually. And some of the photos I saw, I, I wasn't aware of how destroyed the country was. He ended up getting a job with the U.S. Army as a translator and driver. And that's when he met his teacher. Uh, his name was uh, Chitose. So <coughs> he stayed there, I don't know how long, but he, long enough to marry, have a few children, and train karate and judo, and decided to move to back to Canada. So he came back in 52. So I guess he was about 15 years over there. He... Uh, he started a dojo in Toronto, and nobody knew what karate was. The judo had been around for a while. So, in fact, they, they started making their own geese because there's no place to play. His wife would make them, and they were black because they knew about judo. They didn't know what this stuff was. Yeah. And he was a small uh, Japanese man. Like, uh, he wasn't powerful built or anything, but he was strong because he was fast. And he'd have people coming in on the, off the street and challenging him, and like these bikers and so on. So <laughs> you have to like, show them. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, a story when one guy came in and challenged him, and he did one of these jumping kicks. He would wore, This guy was wearing a big crucifix, kicked the thing, and buried it right in the guy's chest. Oh, my goodness. Brutal. So he had, to, he had to prove himself over yes. and over. And um, when I got to training, so the fellow who was teaching in Newmarket that I inherited the school from trained there. So I started going there twice a week in the, in the city. And he, at, after a tournament, I think I was a brown belt at the time, he uh, approached me and says, you come to my school. And he passed me a little card stamp paid. All the years I went there, I never paid a dime. <laughs> he kind of took me under his wing and uh, guided me. 
uh, and trained me hard. And one day I said, since I want to go to Japan, I said, okay, get a haircut yeah. <laughs> first. <laughs> and then he would kick the crap out of me every night with the, it's called a shinai, it's a bamboo stick. If you're not low enough, you'll smack the back of your legs. If you're not doing it right, wham, against it. It was, if they did that crap today, yeah. they'd be in jail. Yeah, yeah. the news cameras would be there. Oh like, my God, yeah. But we did it and it was, we yeah. liked it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and once he knew that you wanted to go there, so did he ramp it up to another oh, yeah. level because he, he was preparing you yes. for when you go over there? Yes. He's, and so he sent me first to his teacher. Okay. So his teacher, Chitose, lived in uh, Kumamoto in the southern island of Japan. So I was very excited going there, as you can imagine. I land in, in uh, Kumamoto. I get picked up the airport. And we're training. And so I'm living with his teacher, who's a 10th Dan Grandmaster. He's 86. His son is sort of his second command who does a lot of the teaching. The dojo is the backyard, which is dirt. And um, all these old Okinawan training tools, like these cement blocks that you hold with a handle that when you punch it can't droop down. Or these, uh, they're called geta. They're like a flip flock with things on the bottom that you wa work with, and they're made of iron. So you practice your kicks holding them on to strengthen your legs and so on and so on. And training on that floor, or floor of the ground, I wasn't used to it. It was like a gravel, a very fine yeah. gravel. It was like sandpaper. So after a couple of weeks, I could hardly walk. <laughs> I wasn't used to that. And we were training a few times a day. So it was pretty intense. I stayed there for about uh, three months, I guess it was. And then I traveled to uh, Tokyo. And uh, there was another school I wanted to visit there. And um, I ended up getting an introduction letter when I, uh, from another teacher to go to this school. And that was this, that's the organization I've been with ever since. Um, it's called the Japan Karate Association. They're world uh, famous. They're the first organization to export uh, karate to the rest of the world. And the founder, excuse me, the founder was the fellow who introduced karate to Japan back in 1921. Wow. So Funakoshi Sensei. And his top student was Nakayama. And I lived in his dojo. And if you live in that dojo, it was pretty sparse. It's a room about this size, oh, man, not even two bunk beds. And that's it. No heat, no insulation, no heat. Just by a big blanket. Yeah. And you had to train every morning. And uh, you're on your own. The only two rules. You had to train every morning and no girls allowed. <laughs> <laughs> that's it but you had to show up every morning at uh, 7 30 for practice yeah and we would train down there in the mornings and then i would train at the the main school uh, which was about five blocks away which was a place that you had to have some thick skin to be in there because every so people came from all it was like the mecca for karate and all these really good guys from all around the world came to train there and you had to carve your way in there and yeah. stand your ground because it wasn't easy. There was blood on the floor every day. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was rough. It, so were you there for like a period of time all at once? Or did you yeah. go there for a bit, come back, go there for a bit? Or yeah. a mixture of both? So I, because I couldn't afford, well, I couldn't get a job there. And if I had a job there, I couldn't train. So I would come home and work my butt off and save money and enough to live on. I'd go for four months at a time. Yeah. So I'd go and train three times a day, um, once on Saturday and Sunday off. <clears throat> and then um, come home, get back to work. I was lucky when I worked at De Havilland, they actually gave me a leave of absence uh, twice. And the first time I quit my job because I wasn't at De Havilland yet. Quit my job and just went. And then when I got back, I tried to find a job and uh, ended up working for De Havilland. And they did support me. Uh, the one time I, was, I made the national team and they supported me and the union actually gave me a little bit of a bursary to uh, buy food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing to have when you're training your Yeah. Mom. Uh, yeah, so, it, and that was, uh, it was rough. It was rough. Yeah, I'm just trying to, like, even paint a picture. So at this time, it's, you know, Canadian new market kid. You're in Japan in this crazy environment that mm -hmm. only very few will ever experience in their whole time. You're also having to come back, work your butt off, just to get the money to get there, too. What, what, uh, and, that, and you're competing, too. Yes. So it's uh, an intense time in your life. Oh, yeah. So how old are you and how long was that for? So the first time was 78. I was, I guess, um, 23, something like that. And it, it was a different world then, too. I, I, I was working as a bouncer at the Compass at 21 years old. Yeah. When I look around at the average 21-year-old male today, 
I'm thinking, there's no freaking way <laughs> you no. would be doing this guy. Like standing up to grown men. Football. The, the Toronto Argonauts used to train at uh, in Aurora at uh, St. Andrews College. And they'd come drinking in there. Yeah. And I'd watch these guys come in and think, oh, my God, I hope they don't cause a problem. <laughs> fortunately, they didn't because they did kick off the team. Yeah. But that's what you had to deal with. And these these guys would come in, they smash bottles. Like, this Craziness. Yeah. Different so time. it was a different time. It, it truly was. Uh, you became independent much sooner. Yeah. You know, when you're a kid, you pay board once you're working. And when you're making enough money, you're out of the house. Yeah. <laughs> you don't live with mom and dad. No. I understand circumstances are different today. And people go to school yeah. longer. They have dad. And so, okay, I get that. However, it wasn't that unusual to be where I was at my age because of the upbringing. Yeah. Um, and it was tough. It's more civilized nowadays because the teachers that I had then are still there. Now they're in their 70s and their 80s. Back then they were in their 40s and in their prime. And they were kicking you up and down that floor every day. <laughs> but that's how you get good. Absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so we're going to take a quick break, and then uh, we're going to hop right back into it. Just a quick shout-out to our sponsor, Buzz505. Buzz505 was founded by the Snap team to create a new way to record and develop a professional turnkey solution to podcasting. They recognize the power of podcasting and they have been great to work with in making of this podcast. Check out www.buzz505.com to learn more. Back to the show. Okay, and we're back. So we just left off probably the most intense of mixture of things going on, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Training, competing, traveling, working. working. Um, you know, would you say that was the most intense time or no? Yeah, I would say so. And, and you know, with most uh, people who reach a level of success in, well, definitely in sports, but in music, and it, it t tends to be their 20s when they make the most significant advances. Yeah. And if they do it well, they can write out the rest of their life on what they've achieved there. And that is the time when you have the energy yeah, the endurance to really suck it up and just get it done. And um, so you did that. What, what what's the what was the highest competition win or experience? Not even win experience where it's like, wow, I cannot believe. Oh yeah, I'm in here. <laughs> well, um, of course, um, to, in order to make the national team, you have to win at your national championships. So. Um, I would compete in all the events. So in karate, the sport of karate, which will be in the Olympics, this one, once. Yeah. <laughs> We're not in after that. How come? Uh, it's a political thing. Oh, okay. Which, that's a whole nother yeah. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we have this opportunity that for the public to see uh, what it looks like. But you have the combative aspect, which is kumite, the sparring. And you throw kicks and punches at, at um, target areas. You have to come very close or slightly touch with full power. So the idea is you have to have enough power that if you actually follow through, you do damage. And sometimes you follow through too much. You've got to imagine you're moving around. Everybody's moving around. Yeah. You have to have laser accuracy to get in and out without damaging the person. And but it's a point system? And it's a point system, yeah. 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 Uh, in fact, I used to compete in the heavyweight divisions. And uh, to get a point and to the body, you had to hit them pretty hard. And way back, we didn't wear a glove on our hands, and our knuckles are conditioned like steel. Mm -hmm. So you had to nail a guy pretty good. Just boom, right in the ribs. It's like, oh, yeah. You know, you go back to the line, think, oh, that was a good one. And the guy wore a point. Go, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you're sore for a couple of weeks, and, you know, you kind of get on with it. And actually, funny story, I was, uh, when I got a job at the Howland Aircraft, they, they uh, took my application, so I said, okay, fine, but uh, we need to get you to get a, a chest x-ray. I said, yeah, okay. They send me to this place, this clinic, I walk in there, the guy takes a shot of my chest, and the doctor's in the room. He puts the picture up on the wall, you know, the, the lit thing. He's looking at it. He's, he looks at me. He looks at that again. He said, you been in a car accident? <laughs> I said, no. Why? So well, what's all this? <laughs> so he's looking at all these broken ribs yeah. that are almost in a circle because when you stand sideways, that's the target. That's where they hit you on either side. And it looked like I'd been thrown against a steering wheel. Yeah. And broke all my ribs. <laughs> <laughs> um, we didn't know. We just, no. you know, oh, that hurts, man. But you don't laugh for a couple of weeks, and it's all right. It's yeah, all good. it's just a bruise. Yeah. Uh, we, a little bit know. more, but whatever. Yeah. So uh, you win the Canadian 
yes. championships? So the combative part I did okay, and I did better in the forms part. So we had a group, and it's called Team Kata, synchronized movements. And uh, we, uh, the son of uh, Soroka Sensei, myself, and another uh, guy, Kim Dunn, had a team, and we, we did really well. They were really good because yeah. they're smaller guys and they're fast, and I had to keep up to them. So training and competing with them really upped my speed. And uh, we got to compete in Egypt at the World Championships. And being there was, from a competi competitive standpoint, the most, uh, or the highest level, I guess, and, and the pinch me, I'm here kind of thing, because you're in that competition with the best in the world. Yeah. And they're coming out on that floor and they're showing what their stuff, and you're nervous as hell, uh, but you do it. Yeah. Like walking in behind your flag is one of the proudest moments I'll ever have. And uh, it, there's very few people who get that opportunity. But you, they, you earn it. It's not something uh, like a lottery win. No, yeah. you work hard, and here's the reward. Yeah, and it goes back to what we were saying earlier, right? Yeah. You uh, won that opportunity by right. hard, hard work, right? Right. And exactly. that was that was in '85. Right? Uh, that was '83. '83 yeah. and '83 was a busy year, wasn't it? it? Was yeah. We competed at the World Championships. There was a Pan American Championship in Venezuela. We competed. Yeah. At. There was a America versus Canada in um, San Francisco. Uh, and I had been in Japan for three months before that. So, yeah. <laughs> busy. <laughs> busy, busy. And um, so I think it was in 1990 is when you decided to stop uh, competing and focus yeah. on the teaching. And coaching. And coaching. Yeah, actually, I became a uh, national coach. Uh, so I was comp when I retired from competing, I started coaching for Ontario. Uh, but I had to stay away for a couple of years because it was just, you can't be on the sideline for a couple of years when you get out of that. Because <laughs> the juice is still oh, in Oh, yeah, yeah, it just <laughs> drives you crazy. So I, I kind of went away for a while, came back and started coaching. And uh, then got a position coaching the national team. And we traveled quite a bit. And the highlight there was competing, or coaching rather, um, at the Pan American Games in Winnipeg, 1999. Got to walk into a stadium with 54,000 people in the stands with our flag coming in last with the stands, everyone in the stands flat with the Canadian flag and yeah. the whole thing. It was so amazing. <laughs> you know, planes flying over top and all. It's like the Olympics. It, yeah. Well, the Pan Am Games are the second largest uh, athletic event behind the Olympics. And uh, since it was hosted in, um, in Canada. Uh, yeah, stakes were high. Oh, yeah. It was great. <laughs> the fan base was there. Oh, yeah. They sure were. <laughs> when, um, when did you get to that location that you're at now? Because... So um, even before the podcast started, you know, I was looking through pictures and stuff and it's like this unbelievable setting, which when you drive by it on main street, you would never know what's behind those walls. So mm. what was the process of getting that location and then your thought process of building it and what you wanted to build at that location? Cause okay. it's clearly very important. You know, yeah. Yeah. So that I had moved, I had the dojo on Main Street, and we kind of, well, actually, the landlord um, just raised the rent to a point where it wasn't, good. we're going through a lot of that right now. Yeah. <clears throat> so I had to move somewhere else, and it was actually Tom Taylor at the time, who was a town councillor, and a few other councillors. They took the, uh, the town took the old, what's known as the lofts, which are now loft apartments. Yeah. Um, originally, those have been around a while, know it as the office specialty building. Uh, they... They purchased it, and they were going to make it into like an arts and cultural center. So they, uh, myself and Peter Stanton, a good friend of mine uh, who started his dance school in my dojo when, with a few spare hours here and there, um, he and I appealed to the town and said, do you think we could go in there? And they, so they said, well, okay, let's go have a look. And they showed us a space, and they said, well, here's the space. It looked like crap. There was old fiberglass caked on the walls and everything else. I said, okay, what the hell, let's do it. So we took the space, put a wall down the middle. He had his dance school on one side. I had the dojo on the other side. And I built a really nice dojo. I was still working full-time, so it was still, uh, call it a part-time dojo. Yep. Um, but it was nice. It was a, I put down a proper floor. Um, it was very hot in the summer, cold in the winter. It's an old, old factory building, right? Then it expanded to a point where I had to take the upper floor uh, to put a gym in there, and then I ended up, ended up living in there. So as I was preparing to leave my job to do this on a full-time basis, 
I'll admit, I left work one day without punching out my clock because I had some stuff to do to get organized. Yeah. And the company found out and I got fired. And I drove away that day saying to myself, this is it, sink or swim. The safety net is gone. Yep. And I tr came home and it was a tough couple of years because I didn't have any other income and we were struggling to get through. So I built that dojo and it worked quite well uh, for quite a few years. And I, I lived there too. And it wasn't a, wasn't a great place to live at the time. The wind, there was old windows. Snow would come through the window in the winter. And it was boiler heated. But yeah. I was able to save some money. And then um, the town actually sold that building. So I was there 16 years, uh, living in there for 10. Uh, then finally, the, the town sold the building uh, to uh, the people that... Well, actually, the massage college came in. And they took over for a while. And they allowed me to stay. And then uh, the town sold that building to the developer who built the lofts. And then I had heard that the old Audion Theater was going to be up for sale uh, on an RFP, a request for a proposal. So I got all the information, and I was determined I'm getting this no matter what. And I had lots of obstacles because I'm buying this from the town, not yes. from a real estate yeah. you know, or an individual. Uh, and some people, some of the counselors, oh, no, no, I don't think they what, a karate school? I yeah, you have, to, you have to pitch the vision. Yes. Right. And, um, I mean, they're all supportive now. Yeah. But at the time, it was a challenge. So I ended up buying that building and uh, sunk everything into that. Yeah. <laughs> Physically, financially, emotionally. And I mean, buying, it's an 8,000 square foot building. Yeah. And ultimately, I wanted to produce the training facility I wish that I could have trained in. Because... In, and again, I'm not saying this in a boastful way. I'm just saying I think, I, I believe I had the potential to become a world champion. But I never had the opportunity or the training uh, to do that because I was busy teaching others or just didn't, uh, the people who were training me didn't have the knowledge to, they, they had the karate knowledge, but yeah. not to bring you to a sports uh, level. So I thought, all right, I, I went to school and uh, National Coaching Institute. I got my level four coaching certificate which is olympic level uh, built a first class facility and now i'm waiting for the person with the desire to come along and show me you're willing to do the work and we can guide you to that level if you want to so it's all there so we have a training a weight training facility we have uh, top-notch instructors we have instructors coming from japan on a regular basis and the environment looks like you've stepped into a dojo in japan yeah and the purpose of that was to create that environment, that when you bow and come in and start training, it's like you've gone to another country almost, but it's definitely another environment. There's no distractions on the wall. There's no, the things that are on the wall are all significant and mean something. And when you're training in that traditional way, these things matter. So all that's just explained when you join. Uh, we have an orientation class and we walk you through the whole thing because we use the language, um, the cultural um, protocols that are involved. So I, I'm careful the wording I use. I'll just say we take an authentic approach. We'll say. Yeah. There's other approaches. There's the sports-minded approach. And not, not that one's right or wrong. It's just no. if you're going to take a traditional approach to what we're doing, then it involves the cultural points too. But, and it's not everyone can do that. No. You lived it. Well, that's it. Right. That's so, thing. you know, you have that um, built into you. So you have the ability to, yeah. you know, I wanted to say recreate it, but, you know, create that environment where it normally would not exist. Exactly. Right. Where you now you're stepping through those doors and all the ass kickings that you took uh, in <laughs> Japan in a crazy environment. You get to take um, some key parts of that and kind of put it. Yeah. Put the. It's kind of like it. You sift through the things that were abusive. Yes. <laughs> And not useful because some of the old training methodologies were not healthy. They're, they're just not. And yeah. I know many of my colleagues have replaced knees, replaced hips, and so on. And I'll touch wood. So far, all my joints are good um, because I, I, was, I always watch the old guys and how they practiced. I say, oh, yeah, the knee always points the same direction as the toe. Um, uh, conditioning your hands, the way they would do it. I took uh, great observation and, and making notes over the years. Yeah. I have my own little notebook that I've had most of my life that I took notes with that I refer to once in a while. So all that stuff matters. Yeah. Just designing the floor, that it floats. It's not a... Training on concrete or carpet on concrete is worse. Like, you, there's no absorption in that floor for your joints. And over time, your joints take the, the wear. And uh, anyway. Uh, no, it makes 
And so when, how long have you been at that location? Since uh, 2004. 2004. Yeah. And it's like, you get, you get to build, I don't want to say your masterpiece, but you know, yeah, it's going to like, it will have a legacy that lives on. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, for sure. And then visiting many dojos in Japan and around the world, but mainly in Japan, you're getting that sense, that feel, um, some of the ways that it's, I won't say decorated, but there's shoji screens on the wall, for example, and the beams. And when you go into a temple in Japan, they build the walls, or they, they build the roof first. So you have, they put up the beams and the structure to put the roof on, and then they build the walls. So you often see those beams showing through the walls. And even in houses, because yeah. houses, the same thing. They build their roof, and then they build the walls, because all the walls move, because they can transform their house into different, you know, into a bedroom by closing these doors, yeah. or opening them to make it larger. So these beams are often obvious, and it costs a lot of money to do all that. And somebody said, what do you do that for? You don't need to do that, because I want to create yeah. a feeling. Yeah. And uh, like when you come in, it's stone on the wall. And you come into a home in Japan, you step on stone, then you step up to wood or tatami mat. So it's the same thing that you have all these natural elements. You're standing on wood. And I tell my students, you know, if you light a fire to that wood, it'll burn because the energy of the sun is absorbed into wood. That's why it burns. When you stand on that, you absorb that fire. That yeah. So that potential energy is in there. So absorb it through your body. So you need your skin is touching wood. Um, and then all these things are important to me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I love it. Like, that's, I want to ask, like, you know, it's definitely you have always been drawn to that culture, right? Yep. Um, it, Japanese culture, and I don't have karate, 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 yep. karate. Um, what what does the karate mean to you? Like, what have you has it taught you to apply into your life, oh, and every and day. and why? Yeah, like, can you touch on uh, even just a few points of? Um, what you have learned and what it means to you and how you apply that to your everyday life. Because clearly that's like a pillar that you have that you want to teach on to others. Yeah. So um, actually it's pronounced kara te because it's three, it's actually three words. Kara means empty. Te means hand. And do is the Japanese equivalent of Tao. As in Taoism, it means a path, path to enlightenment. So judo, aikido, kendo. Okay. That do means a path. That's your path to enlightenment. Um, martial arts training is often referred to as moving meditation. Yeah. Uh, so that's that term. And kata uh, doesn't mean empty like nothing in your hand. It's an emotional emptiness. So if you're angry or jealous or you had some negative emotion and you hit with your hand, your hand is driven by your mind. So it's your hand is not empty. That's the true uh, Buddhist philosophy of bukata. So we talk about that in class. Yeah. I, I teach that. It's, yeah. It's not... Uh, the, they learn the deeper meanings of some of the, the points. That's why you, we use the language as well. Because the language, when it's translated, actually has meaning. Uh, so, um, sorry, I got away from the point, uh, which was... Well, you kind of did touch on it, too, of um, almost like the deeper meanings. Oh, well, what like I Like the philosophy so, the, of, yeah, the philosophies that you have learned and, you know, applying them to your everyday life. Well, my upbringing, I, I mean... My parents did what they could. My father had a grade five education, was raised in the Depression, um, was a family of 13. One of them died, and the father died around when he was born. So you imagine, it was a tough time. Yeah, He had to leave home at 13 and go to work. And he worked on the Great Lake ships with my uncle and didn't have a lot of opportunity. So he wasn't able to guide me in, in any direction, like in terms of business or anything like that. He, yeah. he drove a truck his whole life. Uh, my mom, she worked at the Bank of Montreal on Main Street from the time before I was born until she retired. A simple life, great people, but a simple life. So um, they raised me. Uh, there's a saying, actually, um, thank God for being born. Thank your parents for raising you. And thank your teachers for everything else. So the teachers that I've had taught me to just shut up and do it. When you're in a class and you're doing a thousand kicks... And when you're at 400, your legs are on fire, your lungs are burning because you can hardly breathe. And you know you got, a, you just, you, there's a switch that you have to develop because it's not there instinctively unless, well, maybe it is sometimes. But most people have to develop that. Okay, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to 
endure this pain and suffering to accomplish what I'm going to do. When you get that mindset, it doesn't matter what you tackle. You're going to do it. And even if you fail, you're going to go back and try again. And you're going to keep going until you succeed or you change your mind. And this is, this is the foundation of success. Yeah. Everybody who's successful in anything has had failures. And this is why I push this, what I talked about earlier, when kids come in, the sooner they learn this, the better their life will be. And if you coddle your children too much or you <laughs> call their university professor because they got low marks <laughs> <laughs> and all this crap I hear, yeah. what are you doing? How are you setting them up <laughs> if you're going to constantly... You're doing them a disservice. Totally. So the teachers I had were not kind. Yeah. They were after. When you prove to them you're worthy of their kindness. <laughs> so that applies to everything you do. Uh, aside from that, just awareness. Like you're driving down the road, you're focused on what you're doing. And, or if I'm doing something, I'm focused on what I'm doing. I'm not doing this and doing that and then thinking about something else at the same time. I, I'm not driving my car, eating a sandwich and listening to the tunes. Yeah. Okay, I'm driving now. Okay, you can eat and so on. But whatever it is you do, you focus on that. And that's part of what you have to learn also to be safe in martial arts and not get your head kicked in. And you're forced to because you got a guy in front of you and in our training drills, we say, we say in Japanese, okay, I'm going to punch you in your head. Yeah. So, okay, now here it comes. And he has to try to do that. So if you're not focused on what's going on, that's what happens. So it forces you to learn this focus. Yeah. And uh, I think that's, the, it's, it's given me the discipline to, I haven't, my weight hasn't changed any more than five pounds my entire life. I'm 65. I'm still 203 or whatever I was. Uh, I can wear the same clothes I wore back then. And it's, you know, you go party, you do this, or that, you gain a couple of pounds. Okay, for two days, you, you yep. restrict yourself. But you need discipline to do that. You need discipline to do anything and be sex successful. Yeah. So I guess that's really... It's discipline, hard work, yeah. focus, right? Focusing on a task, putting the work in to actually achieve it. Exactly. Being able to handle failures. That's, you know, those things is... Anything you want, work, it, it, business, well, relationships, everything. whatever everything. it is, yeah. all those pieces. It's with our kids. That's why sometimes they don't pass their test. Yeah. And I'll do a whole spiel, and I'll ask all the black belts standing at the front, any of you guys ever failed a test? Of course, more than half of them put up their hand. Any one of you failed the a test, same test more than once? A few of them put up their hand. And he failed the same test three times? I put up my hand. Yeah. Because <laughs> I've been there. I had to go to Japan to do it three times and failed the damn test. Yeah. So I'm the first one to come back to my dojo. In fact, last October, I was in Japan a year ago, and I attempted my seventh dan at the headquarters. Fourteen guys tried, three passed. And me and a guy from France were invited to come back in April to retry, which meant, yeah, you almost made it. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite. So come back and do it. Well, we know what happened. COVID yeah. hit. And yeah. So I ha eventually I have to go back and re reattempt that. But I was the first one to come back and say, well, I didn't make it. And I asked the kids, should I quit? No. Well, what if I go back and fail again? Should I quit then? No. Well, when should I quit? Never. So they're getting it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's something I believe in uh, tremendously too. And, you know, all and all those things, right? There's an intensity to it. Yes. Right. But um, you also have a calmness to you. I don't, I'm not aware of that. No? I'm told that. <laughs> you are, you've been told that before? Yeah. It's, um, you know, pulling from both ends. And even I, you know, I could even be reaching for this too, but, you know, you don't just go as a kid to the forest in the winter and sit there. That's a calm mind. Yeah, I suppose. Everything else is kind of getting shut off and it's just you and nature and the universe and everything else and um i believe isn't that a common uh, practice in the martial arts in the buddhist philosophy too which is attached to it too yeah sure yeah being in tune with the, with the universe yeah and and just yeah you're right well, yeah and that's definitely we, we begin and end our classes with a meditation yeah and in fact i've introduced uh, a step beyond uh, one of my, so nowadays I go to Japan for like two weeks and they, they, there's a camp that runs twice a year and I try and make it at least once a year uh, in this four-day training camp. So I'll go and spend a week or two. And uh, a few years back I went and spent uh, five days at a um, 
uh, Buddhist temple. And we practiced uh, a Zen temple, rather, a Zen meditation, uh, like five, five hours a day. So I, I was right there doing it for, um, and sitting it, and I thought, this, this, now I understand why it's so useful for martial arts training and for, for the average person. There are yeah. people there who have businesses and so on, are busy, busy, and they would go to these, like a retreat. Yeah. And they suffered a lot more than we did. <laughs> but uh, So I introduced, we, even kids, one minute of meditation. I have a bell we use that comes from a temple. You ring it, and you listen for the sound. You practice the breathing that we, we teach. And then on Tuesdays, we do a five-minute meditation, which doesn't sound like a long time, but to sit and count your breaths for five minutes can be hard. Time. Yeah. Yeah, I, the reason I really bring it up too is like this is something that I try to practice and it's hard. I'm trying like looking for 10 minutes just alone, count my and focus on my breath, right? Yeah. And when you have a busy mind and then as well in this world that we live in where everything's on and you know, oh. or I'm attached to my phone and the internet and it's unlimited distractions and you know, I think it's important to kind of tune yourself out from the external world yeah. and kind of be in your internal mind, you know, the same, same way of thinking, um, the kids coming in and, you know, everyone getting a medal and how that's wrong too. It's like these kids growing up, it's just like yeah. everything is on all the time. And it's like, you're never going to get a break unless you build that practice into your life. And yeah. I think so, it's, uh, something that's extremely important. Yeah. And if they're not exposed to it, then how, how are they going to cope? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, many principles. I got to come up and see the... <laughs> I got to come up and see it. Ah. Okay, we're going to end off with... Um, what question should I ask? Okay. You get to put a billboard on Main Street, and it gets to say anything that you want. So people driving down Main Street, they get to see it. What would you put on that billboard? Hmm. It may be interpreted wrong. In fact, I'm going to do this anyway in a newspaper ad. So when I was 55, I took a picture of uh, myself. So when I was in my 20s, I used to work part-time as a model, too, because I tried to get into action films. Okay. No. I actually got into a few. But I, on the sideline, I ended up working as a model, and it was kind of fun. Great way to meet girls. Yeah. <laughs> and get clothes that fit you, because I was too damn busy to go shopping. So I'd show up and do a show. And there'd be a whole rack of clothes that actually fit me. I said, oh, I'll buy these and take them home because I had no fashion sense, really. Anyway, um, so I had a picture of myself in a modeling comp with no top and a karate belt on and just standing looking to the side. So I was in my peak of condition. I was 28 years old. I took a picture when I was 55 in the same position. I put them side by side in the newspaper. Yeah. And the ad said, we don't stop training because we get old. We get old because we stop training. And then uh, a few bullet points. So I would like to do, now that I'm 65, I really want to do that again. Yeah. But I don't want it to be misinterpreted as vanity. I want to be a living example of um, hard work and discipline over a lifetime, but not fanatical. Like, I drink beer. Yeah. Pretty much every day I'll have a beer. I'll have a pizza. I'll have this or that. But I know when enough is enough, and I know when to say to dial it back. And that's where the discipline aspect comes in. So you can live... I believe in the 80-20 rule. Do what you should do 80% of the time, and then your body can deal with the other 20 yeah. if you're healthy. Um, so if it was a billboard, there would be something along that line, maybe a different headline, but bullet points. Why would somebody practice a martial art for 55 years, 52 years, whatever it might be? The, then some bullet points to learn the discipline to have a healthy life, to make, keep up your flexibility past whatever age and so on and so on and so on. I'm at a point now in my life where I can be in the dojo where I've got adults starting up who are really stiff and I can put my hands on the floor. I make cracks all the time. Well, you have to be a senior citizen to be able to do this and that. Yeah. <laughs> kind of rubbing in a bit. Uh, but something like that to, to, if anything else, to be a living example of hard work and discipline. Yeah. And because it betters your life. Yeah. And if a young person sees that and it ignites a spark in them, to say maybe they'll follow a different path, but to realize it starts now. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. You know, so I don't think you put that on a no, billboard. No, 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 I like that. I like that. And, um, you know, I think I might have to have you back on for a part two at some point. <laughs> you know, you're just down the street anyways. Sure. We could do it. I really enjoyed it. I really, really did. Well, so thanks. thank I'm you for uh, being here. Glad to, to be able to do this.